Hi, I'm Krista Ratcliffe, Chair of the Department of English at ASU, and I'm so pleased to welcome you today to our event with fiction writer Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. The Tomorrow Talk series places the thought leaders of today in conversation with the change makers of tomorrow, our students. Each distinguished speaker will explain how they use writing to address our most pressing challenges. This year, the series celebrates trailblazers. And in addition to Johnson, we'll be hosting Booker Prize finalist Percival Everett in November and sports journalist Jamal Hill in January. We hosted novelist Jonathan Franzen last week. Tomorrow Talks are a student engagement initiative led by the Division of Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at ASU and hosted by ASU's Department of English in partnership with Macmillan Publishers. Jocelyn Nicole Johnson is the author of My Monticello, a fiction debut that was called A Masterly Feat by the New York Times, which placed third on the Times Magazine's 10 Best Book of the Year. My Monticello won the Weatherford Award, the Lillian Smith Prize, the Balcones Prize, and was finalist for many others, including a National Book Critics Circle Award, a Penn Faulkner Award, and an LA Times Book Award. Johnson has been a fellow at Tin House, Hedgebrook, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Her writing appears in Guernica, The Guardian, and elsewhere. Her short story, Control Negro, was anthologized in the Best American Short Stories 2018, guest edited by Roxanne Gay, and read live by LeVar Burton. A veteran public school art teacher, Johnson lives and writes in Charlottesville, Virginia. The paperback edition of My Monticello is now available for purchase, so if you haven't read it yet, go and get your copy today. Tonight, Johnson will be talking with Kyle Jensen, who is Professor of English and Director of Writing Programs at ASU. Kyle is the author, co-author, or co-editor of six books, including most recently, Kenneth Burke's Weed Garden, published by Penn State University Press. So please join me in welcoming Jocelyn Nicole Johnson and Kyle Jensen. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I want to echo uh, Chris's sentiments from just a moment ago and encourage everybody in the audience tonight to go immediately and buy my Monticello. I personally am so grateful to you for having written this book. And I wonder if you would be willing to read a passage from it um, this evening for those who have not yet had a chance uh, to read it. Yeah, thank you all so much for having me. It's nice to talk to you from Virginia. Uh, I'm gonna read um, just the very beginning of a short story called Virginia is Not Your Home. And it's the second story in this collection. The collection has five short stories and then a novella that takes up the majority of the book. And uh, this used to be the title before the title became My Monticello. And it's a story about someone who wants to have a different name, wishes she was from elsewhere, and that, I, that feeling of wanting to just to change for whatever reason. Virginia is not your home. They hung that name on you at birth, but Virginia was never your home. Read nausea by Sartre and give yourself a new one. Trumpet your new name to the liver spotted washroom mirror like a coronation. Gape your mouth, then angle your tongue behind your teeth. While you're at it, work to remedy those other afflictions that fetid LR that has planted itself in the middle of words like wash, Scrub the stink of manure from your clothing, and while your young body churns over the basin, keep whispering your new still secret name. Believe that if you can just change this, you can change everything. When your furtive girl body begins to unfold, pull your hair back so severely that the boys don't tug you down below the bleachers. Take to wearing father's faded flannels to ward off solicitations to their string of tissue paper dances. Don't accept it when they ask, who do you think you are? 
whenever you test some sweet protracted word on your tongue. Don't accept the moldy hymnals, the marquee salvations, the wayward way that mama courts heaven like a scornful lover. Don't ache too badly for the milk cows in the pasture, their slick contoured ribs pressing through. Take French, lock your doors and trust in your 16 year old self. Thank you. So as you mentioned uh, just a moment ago, this is one short story within the larger collection, which obviously includes uh, the My Monticello, which is the novella. Why did you decide to read us that particular passage this evening? Yeah, well, I chose that one for a number of reasons. One is it just gets at this idea that's a theme throughout the whole collection of kind of home and belonging and kind of interrogating that. And personally, I I think that part of the project of this whole book and of these stories was to explore the ways that I feel at home in Virginia. This is where I was born. This is where I was raised in this country uh, of America. This is my home. Unequivocally, it shouldn't really be something that I have to think so much about. But then there's these ways in which I subtly often don't feel at home, um, sometimes more than others, for all these different reasons. And so uh, I like that that's a theme in that story in this really personal way. And then also it has like a, an interesting point of view. And the stories are so many, you know, each story kind of has a different voice, a different point of view in the collection. Um, you know, you've got very dramatic, different ways of telling. And then lastly, because it's all Virginia, um, this story has kind of this map of this one person's life, but it has a lot of the little places in it that we'll see elsewhere. So it's kind of like this overview of Virginia. And then we kind of focus in on Charlottesville or, or on Alexandria or, you know, in the Shenandoah Valley, we kind of see these little, these places and other stories. So that's, that's why I chose That's wonderful. Thank you. So when I talk to student writers, one of the common, most common misperceptions is that talented professional writers such as yourself do not encounter difficulty during the drafting and revision process. I often reply to them by saying that the work of writing is really difficult for everybody. I wonder if you would share the most difficult aspect of writing my Monticello and if you have any advice for young writers who are confronting the more difficult aspects of writing, how do you deal with it? Yeah, so yes, writing is hard for me. I can speak for myself and for the people in my writing group. There's moments where things flow, but it's difficult. And uh, one really hard thing is keeping at it and being persistent. Um, I've been writing for a really long time, pretty seriously, where I found an agent, sent out manuscripts, you know, over like a 15 year period, I'd done this and not had things sell, like gotten really close to it. And while getting published, a book published isn't the end all, it was kind of this goal and this affirmation for all the work and care that I put into these pieces. And so it would be really hard not to have it like pay off in the end. So it was a long process for me. I would say the thing that's helpful to me is you have to like learn to love the actual part that you have control of, which is the both the joy and the fun and the excitement, but also the struggle of writing it, right? So the difficulty, like there's there can be satisfaction in there because often you, if you like push through it, there can be this moment of like, I figured out a solution. I mean, you're never going to think what you make is perfect, but you're just kind of trying to make something better than you. So you're always kind of pushing at the limits of what you can do and that's how it should be. And then another, one other thing I would say is you have to find like people, your people, right? So that can be, you know, you kind of all, always have this fantasy of someone above you, like some professor or some agent or some editor lifting you up and, and kind of showing your worth. But really, it's also those people beside you, like the people you're going to class with whose work you admire, the people if you're able to go to workshops and things or work with other writers or create a writer group in your community. Um, those are the people who are going to become your audience and are going to cheer for you and help you. And you're going to see as they go out and try to do things, you're going to learn from each other and you're going to share with them. And then all together, you know, if all when all of it comes together, you're going to have something hopefully that you get published that you're really proud of and that you put like a lot of care into. So. Yeah. I appreciate so much your comment about finding your people, because that's something that I think sometimes we also have misperceptions about, or especially young writers, that the really exceptional writers are kind of sitting alone with a typewriter or a computer or a laptop in an isolated space. And I make a habit of 
talking about my mentors, you know, the, I, I, my students will tease me probably about this, but, you know, I have my dissertation advisor, Ron Fortune, as someone who I'm constantly relying on to kind of champion my work and to give me that encouragement, but also to ask those really hard questions. Did you have a teacher or a mentor that just intervened in your life and said, this is something that's real for you. This is a possibility and you should do it. You know, I didn't have like one person. I had a lot of people do it a little bit. <laughs> you know, I just had moments where someone was like, oh, this is really interesting. You should try to go to try apply to Hedgebrook. This might be a space for you. You know, like where where someone believed in me and then gave me like an encouragement or a suggestion of something to do. Um, I had many you know, I, every summer I was a public school teacher and I worked full time teaching the whole time I wrote this book and the previous ones that I talked about in that 15 year period. So in the summers, I would try to go somewhere, um, try to take some sort of workshop where I was working with other people, often people who were getting MFAs who are, who'd gone to college for writing, which I did not do. Um, and I, you know, in those spaces, I was able to find people who were champions to me, but really my, I would say my peers and my my, my writing group that was an informal group here in Charlottesville that I was with, am still with and was with for 15 years, really for that whole time, have been super helpful to me. They suggest that I send, you know, they read Control Negro, that story first, and told me, I was like, should I show this to anyone or should I burn it? Because it's not <laughs> crazy and I'm not sure. And they said, no, you should show it to someone. <laughs> and they suggested, you know, the place that ended up getting published, Guernica Magazine. And so really, you know, look to the people around you and look for writers that you like what they're doing. And, you know, that can be really helpful too. Since you mentioned it just a moment ago, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how teaching, you know, younger students influences how you think about the work of writing. Did it shape your work at all or having to kind of interface with people who are eager to learn or in some cases may not be terribly eager to learn? It's definitely both in a public school classroom. So I taught visual arts, as I said, um, for 20 years in Virginia schools in different parts of Virginia. And I think it definitely influenced me. First of all, you have, you know, the, what you do in life is the material for your work. Mm -hmm. And that can be, you know, to do with writing, but it could be something else too. Like just the places I've traveled, the things I've done, the experiences I've had, the even when I'm imagining things outside of them, I'm using all of those. And so for teaching, you just have access to like a lot of people and a lot of personalities and a lot of different, in a public school or the schools I worked in, just different kinds of people, people from different places, people, you know, kids just come and they are so themselves. And it just reminds you of all the ways you can come into a space. And then you have all this interaction with people who might not choose to be in that space together. So I think it was a real gift to me to have access to this. And I constantly was encouraging people about their artwork. It was a visual artwork. It wasn't writing, but the ideas of it are the same. What do you want to say? What are you going to look at? How are you going to manipulate these materials? And I like really took it, you know, I took my, my tiny students, like, their expression as seriously as my own. And I often have to remind myself what I would say to them because when it's your thing, it feels different. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So often there are stories behind the stories that we write. For example, while writing my one of my most recent books, I was doing archival research and I discovered that Ralph Ellison read an early draft of Invisible Man standing in the living room uh, of a, a famous rhetorician named Kenneth Burke. And he, they asked him to stand on a tattered rug and they still had have the tattered rug to this day. They call it the electric carpet in honor of him. This story didn't really make it into the final version of my manuscript, but it nevertheless shaped how I thought about my argument and the kind of storytelling I wanted uh, my book to do. So I wonder if there is a story behind the story of writing my Monticello that shaped the book in a meaningful way, but didn't actually make it into the final manuscript. I love that. That's really, that's really interesting, the Ralph Nelson. Um, yeah, so I would say for me, I'm almost always talking about something and then kind of manipulating it in my story. Like there's always some inciting thing. And in some cases, like in the story, um, in the novella, I'm really reacting to 
a real event in Charlottesville, August 12th, 2017, when we were kind of the unwitting host of this Unite the Right rally, as some people may remember, um, which was ostensibly in in um, support of keeping, you know, people who wanted to keep the Confederate statues that our town had decided to uh, take down. But, but really was this very, very extremely troubling event where people came with like torches and, you know, uh, banners with swastikas and all this material that was basically, um, I don't know, just extremely troubling. So in dealing with that and thinking about this real thing that had all these details, you know, all these small moments that came up that summer and all the things around it, um, I kind of collected them. And then I, when I was writing the novel, I kind of repurposed them. So I might take something that really happened, but I just changed the way it was. For example, there was a helicopter that was flying overhead that whole day to kind of monitor the this protesters and counter protesters that just crashed and two people were killed. This was just like an aside thing. And that's where I got this idea that the planes wouldn't be flying and, you know, of this unraveling, like that things are just falling apart at the edges. And this is the context for this dystopian story that I'm telling. Um, or there's a scene in the very first paragraph where a mom carry, picks up this toddler on the street. And I kind of, that happened to me. I just was driving through my neighborhood and a a toddler walked out into the street and I like pulled my car over and went and grabbed if you've ever held a toddler it's a very specific thing and I kind of this toddler like put its arms out and I took up and I like carried it and figured out who it belonged to you shouldn't have a toddler in the middle of the street obviously it was not the situation (laughs) but it just stuck with me and so then when I was writing that image came back up so I'm often kind of taking an image something that was real but really repurposing it in the story that's that's something I do a lot And so it sounds like, you know, from from the introduction that Chris offered and knowing a little bit about your history with Virginia, that place is probably one of the foremost concerns that you have, or at least the way that it shows up in my Monticello. Um, You mentioned just a moment ago that, you know, I don't know if you remember or maybe you didn't notice, does does the work that you're doing in my Monticello act as a kind of reminder that this is something that happened and it ought not to be forgotten because we need to remember just how harrowing these events were that sometimes these details get lost to history, but we need to narrate them and revisit them over and over again to confront the horror that you depict so clearly in the, in the novella. I think a hundred percent, like, I think it's really, really easy to take something that was bad and kind of flatten it to a sentence or to one idea or to one image but for me, that experience, because I lived here, because I was teaching men, because I lived so close to downtown where it took, where the epicenter of it took place, and because it was like a whole summer of buildup, kind of like watching a train coming and you know it's going to crash and you're just watching and watching and wondering how it's going to be. There was so It was such a rich and deep and terrible experience that I wanted to remember all the parts of it. Or at least I didn't want to forget them. I don't know how to explain it. It's not that I wanted to remember them, but I just felt like it was important to mark them. Um, It's amazing how quickly things become history and we move on and we have new things. You know, this was before the storming of the Capitol. These things, even where it fits in time and how you think about it as the world changes, changes. But it was such a distinct moment of before and after for, for me. And I really wanted to not only remember what happened, but remember how it felt. I really, I think one of the projects of that story was just to think about how these events, the reaction in the emotional and in the bodies of the characters and the emotions and bodies of the characters. Yeah. I just, I'm in absolute awe of your ability to write about something like the the lived space that you experience in these events that very obviously shape how you experience that lived space and where you've been virtually, virtually your whole life, I would expect. When I try to write about where I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and there's a lot of events that happened there that I want to be remembered that I think kind of also get lost in the shuffle. And I have a really hard time kind of separating myself from those events um, to remember them in a way that is bigger than my own kind of perspective or bigger than my own, you know, desire to have it be remembered in a particular way. How do you as a writer get just enough distance from kind of your own lived experience or maybe lean into that more, more readily, or how, how do you negotiate writing about a space that's so close to you and formative of how you identify uh, as a person, not just as a writer? I don't know. 
you know, I think, I think you're just kind of trying to find the window in. So for that story, I wrote it not, I didn't write it until about a year after, um, after the event. So I, I spent a year like sitting with it and thinking about it and thinking, what am I going to do with this until I kind of found, I kind of think of it like you're just trying to find like a little opening. And then once you find the right shape or the right entry point, mm -hmm. then it can sometimes work. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it could work. And in this case, for me, um, I was going to all these events about it in the anniversary. And at one event, I had this um, a person set up and was introduced as a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, um, a black woman. And I like, I say this all the time, but it's true. I like saw her pumping gas like the next day. It was like, she was everywhere. She was like just around all of a sudden. And it just made me think like, oh, people who's, who were enslaved people at Monticello's relatives still live here. You know, it just, it connect for me, the connection of her, her standing up connected August 12th, 2017 to, you know, Monticello and to Thomas Jefferson. And this, it made this line. And for some reason, that was the key for me to make the story work. Yeah, you know, yeah. I couldn't just tell a story about people came and they were, you know, they were really mean. It had to be something more or something different. I needed something else. And so I imagine this young protagonist who is also a descent, an imagined descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And she was kind of the key to thinking about um, how the story would be and then pushing it a little into the future and saying, what would happen and what would the world look like if this continued along with our infrastructure falling apart, along with our climate crisis? How would that look and how do these things relate? And, and then I'm going to figure out in the story how I feel about these things and what I can do with them. Well, you solved the problem. It's an absolutely beautifully written novella and so harrowing, uh, the emotional impact. I, it, it's not a surprise to me at all that you've received the, ex the extraordinary reviews of the work that you have. Um, in the first story of My Monticello, Control Negro, the story is narrated by a father uh, who has observed his son's life at a distance. And as we come to learn, the father is a professor who is using his son as a control to determine whether, as he writes, given the right conditions, America could extend her promise of life and liberty to me too, and maybe to someone like me. Your story reminded me of Paul Beatty's The Sellout, which depicts a father um, who carries out experiments on his son to confront the hauntings of racism against Black communities in the U.S. As a writer, what are the advantages of framing the hauntings of racism in terms of controlled experiments, particularly between fathers and sons? Yeah, so I didn't actually come to framing it that way uh like um because that form would work i really was thinking about a couple things i was thinking about um a real incident again that happened at uva where uh, a young man martise johnson was bloodied a black honor student was kind of bloodied by uniformed officers for being turned away from a bar with what they thought might be a fake ID, although it ended up not being fake so i was thinking about this real event again like of course in my mind my twisted mind it it doesn't come out as that, but that is part of it, right? I kind of arrive at that. I was thinking about a friend of mine who many, many years ago, um, a white friend said, oh, we read this thing in school that where this professor proves that, you know, racism with black, the way black people have related to racism is worse than all other groups. In other words, other groups have been able to overcome this and overcome that, but black people haven't been able to. And by the way, the professor was black. Like that was like the, the thing. And that stuck with me like from a bazillion years ago. I'm always like trying to get revenge in my in my fiction, right? So this thing, like it irked me. I was like, what do you want me to get from that? That feels really yeah. um, unkind. And just what do you, what do you mean to say by that? And then I was also, um, I was also thinking about, uh, um, about the everyday harm that happens when I'm trying to explain racism to my son, or especially when he was younger, like, is that its own kind of harm? Right. Or if you have a daughter and you're saying, I really want you to be safe when you go out, can you dress more modestly? Like the way that we put on someone who might be the target of, of harm, like this extra responsibility to be good. Um, but that said, making a formal experiment, this idea that kind of came to me in the story that her, the son is a scientific control, that the father is looking at his life and seeing if he's respectable enough, if he carries himself a certain way, will he be 
Will he be able to achieve America? Will he be able to benefit from America's promise? Will he be able to take advantage of it? it? It compresses it, it exaggerates the ideas and it makes it hopefully more attention catching, right? Um, and so I think, you know, fiction can do that. Like I think of Octavia Butler and like a, a story like Kindred where she uses time travel, this convention that you could use for a million things, but she uses it to take a contemporary person in like the eighties or something back to the time of their ancestors and slavery about, you know, so, and that's different than if you just told a story of enslaved people on a plantation, when you take the sensibilities of the eighties and you put that person into that space, right? That's a different kind of exaggeration. That's a different kind of compression that makes the story work. The disadvantage of doing it though, is that I think people can separate themselves from the story and say, I wouldn't do anything like this where I think we do, you know, in the best case reading that story, I think I would love for people to see the ways we're not the professor, but how we can be too, even, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. it can, you can remove yourself sometimes from it. You can miss. So miss there's that. a kind of like maybe a, a, a conflict between what we're kind of consciously doing, but implicitly carrying out by virtue of our everyday uh, behaviors that we're not consciously engaging in and trying to revise over time is that what you mean yeah we or just we have more subtle ways that we don't even think about these habits of being that are similar right we're we're kind of constantly at least as a parent um but i think even in other contexts i could think of probably we're kind of running experiments if i do this will this happen um and some of those are healthy and some of them aren't you know <laughs> We, I, so I'm a professor and my wife is also a PhD and we have three little girls and we have to apologize to them regularly because we're both researchers. So I, in particular, <laughs> identify with what you're saying here that we know a lot about, you know, childhood development and how literacy learning works and, and the like. And so, um, yeah, I absolutely agree with you here. <laughs> we have to talk about it pretty actively. That's, that's for sure. You mentioned uh, just a moment ago that you think pretty actively about form. And that's very obvious when you read my Monticello. Uh, one of the striking features is how you use different forms to tell different types of stories. Uh, for example, in buying a house ahead of the apocalypse, you tell it from the form of a checklist that ends with the imperative to refresh, refresh, refresh. As a writer, how do you decide which forms are best suited to the story that you want to tell? Yeah, well, one thing I like about short stories and short story collections is you have the option if you like short forms to really play around and try a lot of different things side by side i tend to be drawn to different forms and then um for example the control negro story is you know it's it's a, in a letter form it's epistolary at the virginia you heard that you voice it's like someone telling themselves the story of their life um and in the apocalypse i'm like the personally i'm the queen of of checklist like I love a list I make a list every morning and then it like gets ruined because I put too many things on it and then I have to like turn my folded paper over and like make little mini lists and then I put like post-its on that list with like little clarification so it's like this do living document and so for that story I it wasn't a list I knew I wanted to have someone I knew I wanted that convention I had that that title and I had the idea and I had it in scenes and it wasn't working at all so I remember I was away in a workshop and I mean at a residency and I remember when I found that list form and then it worked so I think there is an amount of experimenting and trying and then sometimes when you find the right thing it kind of comes together but you have to be careful you really want the form to like support what you're trying to do and support the character you can make. In that first story, um, Control Negro, where it's a letter from a father to a son, I needed like some distance. And a letter, like is a formal thing, it has a little bit of distance. It has like this other intended listener, right? There's a secret listener in it because he's writing it to someone else. And that allowed me to like embody that character more. And it just, it feels formal, like a professor would write. And it feels like that character. And that's not me. Um, so I think you, there's a there's definitely a little bit of just experimentation, but then really listening to see what what works for you. And and for me, I always I really really um, am drawn to you. So I often just naturally go into that. And so I have to prune back when it's not working and really embrace it. So when I use the you, I'm thinking this character's telling herself the story of her life. She's warning herself. She's admonishing herself. She's 
she's kind of in her head, you know, you have to think of a reason for it. So it isn't just this gimmick, but it actually fits something about this character or something about this situation. Yeah. I'm a checklist person too. I just have to ask, do you ever like do things and then write it and then check it off after you have, Mm. after having done it? I don't think I do that, but Uh. now I probably. (laughs) (laughs) Helps you feel more accomplished at the end of the day. (laughs) I start with the neatest list and then it just kind of becomes chaos. And then that irks me because I want it to hold the order in it. You know, I want it to have order. (laughs) I'll say one more, one more quick thing is um, in the novella, I ended up reading Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia as part of just understanding him. And in the story, the character is reading him. And so it made sense to me to kind of lightly use the form of that that's why it has the roman numerals there that's the the shape of it the way it looks is just a just a slight nod to that so sometimes the material itself will suggest a form to you and that can just be another layer in what you're doing that's wonderful thank you so in response to the unite the right rally in charlottesville virginia in in 2017 michael eric dyson wrote that the u.s was invested in a bigotocracy which he defines as a systematic refusal to account for the historical violence that non-white citizens have been subjected to since our country's inception. You seem to be dramatizing the stakes of this historical refusal in my Monticello and adding to Dyson's insights how the concentrated restriction of movement creates and sustains such arrangements. Am I interpreting the the story correctly and noticing how often the characters, whether they're black or Hispanic or Indian, are held in place by this bigotocracy? And if so, what role does naming and maybe renegotiating the restriction of movement play in achieving racial justice? Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I definitely, I love one of the neat things about making something that actually is published and that people read is that they reflect it back to you. And it's really interesting to see because there's so much you do that might not be entirely intentional, but has intention to it because of your subconscious. So when you're writing, it really is nice to like draft out and follow those impulses and then step back and look at it and see what's working. So yes, I do restrict the movement of these characters. You know, they start off, they choose to go to Monticello, but after that, they can't go home. They're kind of, when they try to go to town, the roads restrict that they end up having to go up to the orchard and then they're turned away. So they kind of keep getting compressed. And I don't think I was necessarily thinking about, you know, the, the, the men, I call them the men with fire, these marauding white supremacists that, you know, have kind of taken over town. I don't think I was thinking about their refusal to accept history or to acknowledge racism, although I think that's a real thing in the world. I think I was just trying in that restriction to just kind of really make clear and and dramatize this lack of freedom, right? Just bodily freedom, not being able to go where you want to, not being able to be where you want to be. There's this huge longing in the in the main character to go back home, to go back to the, her grandmother's house, which may be in flames or may still be surviving to get her things. And so I also wanted these refugees to like have to develop and have this more nuanced sense of freedom than these men do. The men have the freedom to use force, to, to take over a space, to make people flee, to hurt people. But You know, this group of neighbors who go and flee and take refuge at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's plantation home, they think of freedom as not necessarily what they can take, but this kind of responsibility they have to one another and to make space for one another. So I really wanted that to be there. But to the point of the bigotocracy, um, I think the whole story, like the whole story writ large is kind of refutes the idea that it would be okay for a, I guess it's a case for the opposite of that. It's a case that we should totally, um, that we should totally look at and examine like the troubled past, like it's our responsibility and that it's, it's, it's really like the central, um, it's the central point of conflict for the character, the main character her looking at this past, her thinking about her inheritance in Monticello. And I think it's like really to the point of where we are as a nation right now, thinking about whether it's unspeakable and it shouldn't be said if it makes us uncomfortable or whether it's something that we can look at and think about and should think about. And I think, I think we should look at it. 
I think we really, really risk a lot when we don't because it really erodes the trust we have in one another. And I think we need like, we need everyone. We need us. We need everyone. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, One more question before we turn it over to the students. As I read the end of my Monticello, I could not help but think about that powerful passage in Toni Morrison's Nobel Prize lecture, where she says, we die, that may be the meaning of life, but we do language, that may be the measure of our lives. As a writer, how do you interpret that passage? Yeah, um, to me right now, it makes me think Um, that language for good or ill, whether we use it clumsily or whether we use it really beautifully, is just something so significant and special that we do as humans, right? And it marks us as as different from all other beings. It's something, you know, kind of marks the time that we spend here on this earth. And specifically as writers, it's kind of the material we have, right? The language we choose, the words, the way we line them up, the space that we put in between things. That's what we have to work with while we try to tell these stories, while we try to convince each other of something, while we try to entertain one another, while we try to remember things in our stories. And so, um, you know, just that. <laughs> just that. That's wonderful. So now we're going to um, turn it over to some of our students who have read My Monticello and would like to ask you questions about it. So if we could promote Courtney uh, to ask her question. Sure. Hello. Uh, my name is Courtney, and I'm an English major. So you touched briefly on this earlier, but I want to dive further into it. In this book, locations are often almost as important to the story as the characters are. So what is the importance of focusing not just on what happened or who was involved, but specifically on where things have happened, especially within the context of the racial justice movement? And to make it more specific, how would this book have been different if the characters confronted the past of Monticello without actually being at Monticello? Thank you, Courtney. I appreciate that question. I'm so glad I get to see your face and it's not just uh, someone reading it. Place, gosh. For me in this, I started to write about place before I even knew I was writing about place. So I started just writing what I know, right? I'm born and bred in Virginia. So I was setting these stories in places that were familiar to me. But then, you know, once I got this idea that these were going to be like pins on a map of Virginia, I did focus and think a little bit more about the significance of place and particularly in the novella, right? Because Monticello is already this place that is just full of symbols and objects. And so one of the things I tried to do was just have the objects hold them, hold a space of the emotional weight of the place. Like they just were like, um, for example, Thomas Jefferson's bed is really prominently featured in the novella. And I wanted that bed to like mean like everything about it, just the physicality of it to like hold a weight about who belongs here, who is comfortable here, who is allowed to be comfortable here. And so I don't know the exact mechanism by which I did that, but I I do think that was something that was just top of mind as I was writing these spaces and going into these spaces. And by the way, it's much more fun to go to Monticello when you're like, and my character is going to be in this room and you're like secretly taking notes and they don't know that you're, it feels like you're transgressing on something. You're like, and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. Um, I don't think the story, often when you're writing us or when I'm writing a story, first of all, I'm following a lot of instincts, but then I'm kind of looking at what I did. And I think, I think that putting, you want to make happen in the action of the story, something that mean something beyond what's happening, right? There's like another layer. And so I didn't go, I'm going to write a story where the central irony is that a character who's a descendant is going to be in Monticello and reclaim it. I wasn't thinking that before, but that's kind of what I was like, she's got to go somewhere. She's going to Monticello. She's going to be in Monticello. Like, and then as I realized what was happening, then I can build on it. So I think you want to make external some of the important parts of your story. So placing a character somewhere, placing a character somewhere that's meaning for, meaningful for them or beside someone, you know, you want that sense of tension. And I think putting those characters in that place just created so much tension that it just really carried the story. So it was really significant to it. 
that's really powerful. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. That was great. And so now we have another question from JP. If we could promote JP. Uh... Hi, JP. Hello, my name is JP, obviously, and I am also studying English as well with Courtney. And one thing that I thought was really, really extremely creative that caught my eye was that it was a fiction work for something as nonfiction as my Monticello and as your Monticello in, in, in totality. And you mentioned earlier that you witnessed everything unfold in front of you being in Virginia. And I wanted to ask the question of what role does or should fiction play in addressing contemporary arts of racial injustice? And is there a recent event of racial injustice, injustice that you might think be heard or understood better if it was narrated as a fiction? Yeah, so fiction for something true and especially in terms of racial justice. Um, fiction, the thing that fiction can do is it can tell you how people feel. Like like I said earlier, a big project of this was to, to imagine and to think and to confront how racism feels. So yes, you know, the characters are experiencing these really difficult external things, being expelled from home, but they're also, you know, you, you have access to in their internal lives. So if you, you can write a really amazing non-fictional account of something and you can, there's so much work can go in that, that can be super compelling, but you can't really go into the insides of characters in their internal lives. And I think that's what fiction can do. And it can also take the liberty of creating, um, I don't know, of creating a framework for ideas beyond that. So this is what I mean. This is a story of kind of apocalypse, things are falling apart, but I kind of hide a little utopia in it. There's this idea of this dystopian story, but I have these characters, I'm thinking through, how can we respond to white supremacy? How can we respond to our environment falling apart. And what I do is I put these characters up there that are led by women where Black people have voice, where they're thinking about not just fighting, but also gardening. They're thinking about, they're appreciating and thinking about the space they have and they're and they're contemplating an idea of community that can be diverse and that could be good. So I don't, you can't do that in nonfiction. I think we need those kind of stories if we're going to be compelled to work for social justice, right? We need some sort of framework that we can like hang on to and think about. And again, I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to make this. But just as I was thinking about it, like, how do I want to respond? Those things came out in the story. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it greatly. No problem. So Jocelyn, we actually have a question from uh, the audience, if you'd be willing to answer it. Sure. So um, Jeffrey Jones asks, um, says Monticello is a complicated site in America, exclamation point. How does your work help us to understand the contested meanings of the plantation and the American nation? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think I would. I mean, there's all kinds of things. I'll just say just for fun that when I knew the book was going to be published, I wrote to Monticello and I said, hey, I'm writing a book. It's called my Monticello. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that, you know, there were crickets for a while, didn't hear back from them for a while. They got the, you know, they got the book eventually and read it. And then they were super warm. And, you know, I got to do a talk there and think about, um, I don't know, you know, the books in the book in the bookshop at Monticello now. So it's like this recursive thing where <laughs> if my refugees have to go there in the future, they'll have a manual for how to. <laughs> um, I think that. I would put that back to the reader. How is it helping people to think about this complicated space? I will say that it was really important to me to try to make the factual parts of the book factual and try to make the space as close, as accurate as I could so that it would be familiar to someone who was walking through with the book and things would be in place and objects would be in place um, as best I could. I'm not a historian, but I only needed to understand Monticello as my narrator would. And she's a contemporary young person who has a family relationship, familial relationship to the space, like the people who are descendants there now in the Getting the Word Project. You know, there are people who are in communication with Monticello who are the descendants of enslaved people there. And so 
I would, again, I would put it back to people who have that experience. What does it bring? I will say that there's a book club that came, flew here to go. They made their own My Monticello tour. They went up to Carter's Mountain. They went to Monticello. They went to Mono Alto to look down at the view from the story. Um, and so I don't know. There's like some space to like create your experience of that through that lens too, right? There's all these lenses and that could be another another lens to understanding it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this incredible time that you've given us for answering my questions and for answering uh, our students' questions with such beautiful insight and candor. Appreciate it so much. Um, as we close the event this evening, we want to make sure that we thank our Dean Jeffrey Cohen and our English department chair, Chris Ratcliffe, for their support for hosting these particular events. And I want to personally thank Kristen LaRue and Bruce Matsunaga for their help organizing the event. We absolutely could not do the events without their indispensable help. Um, we also want to thank uh, Peter Jansen and Byron Echevarria from Macmillan Publishers who help us identify incredible writers like yourself, Jocelyn, and help us run these events um, that really have a massive impact on what students understand is possible for their future education. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank our incredible teachers in the ASU writing programs who work tireless, tirelessly to help our students imagine a brighter future. Thank you to everybody who attended this evening. We will make a recording available uh, so that you can recap and identify all of the highlights. There are many, uh, I'm sure. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful and safe evening moving forward. Thank you, Jocelyn. It was a wonderful time. Good night, everybody. Thank you.